Uh, if you'll once again pick up your Bibles. Again, we are in the same passage we have been dealing with in the worship time. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 through Philippians chapter 2, and going all the way to verse 11 this morning. We're going to be dealing with a very powerful point of Scripture. It's probably one of the most powerful and succinct descriptions of the nature and the exaltation and humiliation of Christ that there is in the whole Bible. If you were in Sunday school this morning, you, you, were, uh, you were able to hear as we discussed the idea of uh, the book of Philippians being written by Paul to a church that is doing well. Usually when we hear of his, ep- his epistles, he's writing to a church that has had issues or is having issues and they need to be fixed or adjusted. As we walked through it in Sunday school, we saw that uh, the book of Philippians was written to a church that was, um, that was being encouraged by Paul, that was being exhorted, not only for what they had been doing, but to continue walking in those good things. And in this, we have, in the very start of chapter 2, a description of Christ in such a way that we don't have it elsewhere. And we're going to see that this morning. I'm really excited about getting to share with you. I, uh, I appreciate Bill for uh, sharing with us the announcement this morning and jean for the offertory as well. We're going to be reading Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, as we read for our worship time, all the way to verse 11 in chapter 2. Uh, I'm going to ask you to stand because we're going to read that all the way through. When we have our, the rest of our worship time, I won't ask you to stand for that, but I will at least for this. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. In chapter 2, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love and being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself, Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, and has given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father, we thank you so much for your Son, who you sent not to be just an example for us, who is the perfect example, but you sent on our behalf to bring us into unity with you, Father, we praise you for that. And we thank you for not letting him relish in his humility, but exalting him and giving him the name that is above every name. Lord, Lord of all. We ask you to open our minds and open our hearts as we look into your word this morning. In your son's precious name, amen. You may be seated. Thanks. We're going to start, of course, at the beginning of this passage, verse 27. We've discussed this several times in in Sunday school, and uh, this is another instance where the chapter divisions don't give justice to the the whole argument of the passage itself. Uh, If if I was putting the chapter divisions in, because I'm apparently able to do that, uh, chapter 2 would have started in verse 27 of chapter 1. 
because it carries through with this concept that goes on and on and on throughout the whole of chapter 2, this idea of letting your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. This is what he says in verse 27. Let's go back there. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. How do we live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ? Does that not seem to you a very tall order? Live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. If you were in Sunday school this morning, you saw that we were talking about the concept that our testimony before the world is wrapped up in our fellowship and how we are towards one another. That what Christ has done in us corporately lends to our evangelism in the fact that we have something that we can claim is not man-made, which is the unity that only comes in his Son. A testimony of unity is how we have lives that are worthy of the gospel of Christ. He will bring this up and we will discuss it over and over and over again this morning. This is his argument here. Not only that we have fellowship, but that that fellowship, which by the way, unity, comes as we humble ourselves and treat each other in Christian love. I might be a little more interactive this morning. How's that? There we go. As we go back to verse 27, it says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs. And this is what he wants to hear from him, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Unity. Unity. Now, I use the term fellowship every once in a while when we're discussing this, but the, the term fellowship has, uh, has, has suffered as of late in, in a lot of our churches. We, it kind of conjures up ideas of uh, uh, styrofoam cups and crockpots, but uh, in, in reality, fellowship, as we discussed in Sunday school this morning, is something far greater than that. Fellowship is something that goes much deeper. Fellowship is based in agape love for one another. That's our interaction with each other. If I'm simply coming here and I'm just friends with, say, Nate here, we're friends and we have things in common and we may have common interests. If that's the only level on which our fellowship or our friendship is, we don't have anything that's not man-made. The fellowship we have in the Spirit is something far deeper than that. It's something that we can't do in ourselves, and we'll see that this morning. It's something that we don't have in ourselves and we cannot manufacture. It is something that Christ does in us. This is what Paul wants to hear from this church, that they stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. The metaphor here is a picture of an army. Now, when, when, you, when you have an army, what happens if you have disunity in an army? Do you win the battle or do you lose it? Lose it. What happens when you have unity? You win it. This is, the why, this is why he uses this metaphor. It's actually a picture, and, and uh, for those of you who don't like history, I apologize for the next two minutes, but I adore history. And what he's saying here is so wrapped up in the understanding of who they are in the, in the city of Philippi. This understanding of the, the, the message and the uh, language he uses is this picture of a phalanx. Now, if, if you're not familiar with what a phalanx are, or if history class was a long time ago, it's essentially what it is, is a, um, the Greeks perfected this, um, which is the idea of standing, you have a shield in your left hand and a spear in your right. 
And your shield doesn't just protect you. It protects the man next to you. And the man next to you protects you. And through that, you have an unbreakable wall of shields that was undefeated on the battlefield for a long, long time. And with this reality, you have the idea that each man needs to be doing what he does and what he is called to do all the way along the line because if there is a break, and this, this happened to the detriment, and this is why it ended up failing, is because people did not do what they were called to do, is if one person was not there, if there was a chink in that armor, the opposing army would get in. And there was no protection from the backside once they got through that line. The idea was not to protect once evil got in. The idea was to keep evil out. It was to keep it at bay and never allow it to cross the very first line of defense. Because once it did, you had a problem. Because evil was not meant to be behind that wall. And that's the picture that he's using in here to describe the church. It's the language and the metaphor. And the reason why he's describing this is because in Philippi they're very familiar with this. Uh, if, if any of you are not familiar, the, the, the town of Philippi was actually named after Philip II of Macedon. He was the father of Alexander the Great, who conquered the world using this, among other things, using this as a tactic to conquer everyone. It was named after Philip II, and in there he actually devised his own version of the phalanx, which, which helped his son capture most of the known world all the way to India. And so in, in Philippi, they would be very familiar with this concept, the idea that you have an army, they all have to be exactly where they're to be. It was a linear setup, and if one fell in the front, another one got pushed right up in his place, so that you would never break that wall. And the reality of that is, there's certain pictures in the phalanx that he's using to describe this in this language. Not only are you there protecting the whole army, but you're there protecting one another on the front lines. You're there not only to help one another, but to protect one another. You can't let evil in, and there is only power in unity. The phalanx lost all power when they weren't unified. All power. In fact, they were very worse off because they, they rarely carried a sidearm. They just had one spear, and especially in this type of a setting, you would have one that's about 20 feet long, which is not made for hand-to-hand -hand combat on a one-to-one -one basis. It's made to protect a large group of people that all work together. That's the picture he's using here in describing the church. We're not here by ourselves. We're here in this together. And there's only power in that type of unity. We only have a gospel to preach in that type of unity. Join me in the next section here. Verse 28. By this we will not in any way be terrified by our adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to us of salvation and that from God. What a powerful statement. Our unity, did you see it? Our unity is what proves to the world that we have a gospel that's greater than anything. It's not in our arguments. It's not in our philosophical discussions. It's not in our head knowledge. It's not in our thoughts. It's not in how good we can know Greek or how good we can know Hebrew. I hope it's not in how good we can know Hebrew because I don't. I tried. <laughs> Much to the detriment of my Hebrew teacher. It's only in unity. And I use that term as a replacement for fellowship. I just want us to really see that. Only in our fellowship do we have strength. And only in fellowship do we have a gospel to preach. Evangelism does not start outside these walls. It starts in our hearts. It starts in our relationships with each other. Because if we don't have a relationship with each other that is glorifying to God, we do not have a gospel that is greater than what man can make appear good. We must have a unity that surpasses what we are able to conjure up on our own. And when we strive together, we have nothing to fear. We have no adversary that can fear us when we strive together 
for the glorification of our Father. Those who oppose us will see our testimony. Those who are with us will be encouraged and assured of their salvation. Why do we have to fight? Why does he use military language? It's because struggles and trials are coming, if they're not already here. People will oppose us. Bad things will happen. Whether in this physical world, or whether in the spiritual realm, or whether it's in depression, whether it's in sin, whether it's in any way, the answer is we have a fellowship to fall back on and to proceed with. We must stand together. But how do we do that? How do we stand together? Because that, that, that's a good theological study. And that makes sense. And in fact, that's exactly what the passage is saying. But how does that work? How do we attain that? Practically speaking, how do we interact with each other? I'm glad you asked. Paul discusses that at the very beginning of chapter 2. The first four verses, if you'll join me there. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. There's the unity. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. In case you didn't get it, unity, 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 unity. I want this to be an aspect in everything you do. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Here's how we do it. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Is that a natural way for people to look at the world? To better others at your own expense? To esteem others as better than yourself, to look at others in that form of agape love, which benefits the other person at your own expense. In a word, that's humility. And it's not something mankind has by nature. It's something we gave up in the garden when we tried to put ourselves over God. And every one of us has done that. Pride is the central sin of all mankind. Humility is the central virtue of the gospel. If you don't believe me, we will see this in a second. It's not only how we interact with each other, it's how we interact with Christ. It's how Christ interacts with us. So what does this look like? It looks like humility. It looks like Christian love, agape love, bettering one another at your own expense. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean we drop everything to help someone? Maybe. Sure. Does it mean we put our own desires above somebody else's because we're more important? No. Does it mean we put them above ourselves? And in whatever circumstance we find ourselves, we treat each other with humility. Not just so that we can say we have a really good time together and we can say, hey, you're humble, I'm humble, that's great, that's wonderful, and that's where it ends. That's not where it ends. That's where it starts. Once you have humble minds towards each other, then you can start working towards fellowship because that is where it really comes in. I didn't tell you, if you take notes, I didn't tell you that the sermon title is Unity Through Humility. It's how unity happens. It's how fellowship happens. It starts in Christian love, it continues with humility, and it works together for the unification of the body of Christ. In verse 1, he states the idea that if any of these things are real, be like-minded. If there's any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, if any of these things are real, be like-minded. Because all of those things have to be real in order for that to happen. It has to be in the Spirit. It has to be in Christ. It has to be through affection and mercy. It has to be through all of these things in order for the unity to be true. And all of those things only come to us through Christ. They are not found in ourselves. An army is like-minded. But 
The difference is this. They're not there in that lineup to protect one another based on humility and based on bettering the other person next to them by protecting them. They're doing it either, either out of oath or out of necessity or out of a job back then. How he pictures this is we are not there out of necessity. We're out of there because that's who we are now. The phalanx was a very important design that did conquer a lot of the known world, but in reality, the design of it was very unique in the fact that you didn't primarily protect yourself. You protected the person next to you. You helped the person next to you. It was based in that type of relationship between different soldiers along the front line and along the lines behind them that you are protecting the person next to you and you are depending on the person to your right to protect you. That type of unity can only be happening... There, they're, they're trying to protect against being killed in the physical sense, the very real sense. Here, what are we protecting against? What comes against us? In several different places in Philippians, he talks about false thoughts, false gospels, antichrist, all of these things will come against us. And in order to protect the gospel of Christ, we have to dedicate ourselves to that type of fellowship, to that type of unity, backbiting, gossip, sowing discord. That's why these things are all spoken of as abominations to the Lord. Because if that's a reality in our congregation, we don't even have a testimony to preach. We shouldn't even be involved in evangelism if we can't do that. If we are thinking of ourselves as better than one another, or if we are trying to put ourselves above or even our, our needs above another, we haven't yet grasped the first step in Christian fellowship. Out of what Christ has done for us, our hearts must in our hearts, our heart, our, we must fulfill our responsibility to preach the gospel. And that must be born out of our fellowship together. That's why we meet here. We don't meet here to hear a good sermon or to sing nice songs or even to dress up very nice. We come here because we have to depend on one another. We come here because the Christian life is not meant to be lived separate from anyone else. I'm sorry to say, but the, uh, the monastic tradition got it wrong in that. You cannot live a perfect life wholly removed from everyone else. This is what a lot of the desert fathers back in the Byzantine culture tried to do. A lot of these guys who considered themselves, uh, uh, they wanted to separate themselves from everything in the world and thus by the way, separating themselves from any interaction with the church but they found themselves devoid of any sense of holiness and instead being plagued by their own sins and temptations because they didn't have anyone to live the Christian life with and by nature it's a communal life. Again, I hesitate to use the words fellowship because we have these, these, these wrong ideas of the idea. We, we talked about this in Sunday school this morning, actually a wonderful question. What does the word for fellowship actually mean? As we say fellowship, I mean, again, we, we have a room named after that here. What is it other than, you know, meeting together, doing a common thing? That's an aspect of it. But the word for it brings in the idea of a fellowship and a sharing, a participation, and even, by the way, the word we use for communion. A common unity. Dan actually preached on that not too long ago. The idea of when we come together, that's where we come unified under the body and blood of Christ. Hence we call it communion. Not just giving thanks, but pleading the blood of Christ, knowing that he has saved us from all our sins and has given us a unity that is far beyond any mankind can conjure up. That unity only comes through God. And that's why we have a gospel to preach. It's, it's something we realize about the nature of who we are as Christians, not something we manufacture. It's something we, we know and we learn from the, from the Word of God that that type of fellowship, that type of unity, 
results in fulfilling others' joy. The encouragement that I can get when I see a, another brother, if I have, say, a man over here who's uh, a, a brother of mine, a Christian, and he's going through a trial, he's going through struggles, something bad is happening in life, or as most lives happen, a lot of things going bad all at the same time, and he gets to strive through that, and I get to help him with that, that doesn't just benefit me. Or that doesn't benefit me, that benefits him, but it doesn't just stop there. Because what I can learn from watching him go through that encourages me to see the strength that someone can go through a hard time or trials or these types of things encourages me knowing that God has empowered us to do that. To know that we have access to a God that is willing and able to do that is the very nature of the mechanics of fellowship. This idea of we are benefiting one another, but through that... When we benefit another, they benefit us back, both in encouragement and exhortation and encouraging one another on to Christ. The picture that he says here in verse, uh, in verse uh, 3 is let nothing be done in lowly, or, or excuse me, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Can't skip that line there. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. The concept is raising one another up towards God. I will do anything I can to help you get closer to God. And this person back to this other. I will do anything I can to help you get closer to God. It's the essence of where our fellowship happens. And what he discusses here, he gives that idea, the same thing we discussed through 1 John. And when we see in the first chapter of 1 John, he spells out for us that we must set our relationship with the Father first. We must be Christians first. That's a requirement. Pretty simple one. We must be Christians first. We must concentrate on our fellowship with the Father, our individual relationships, and out of that is born our corporate relationship. So where does fellowship start? If evangelism starts with fellowship, unity, where does unity start? It starts in the individual mind, the individual heart knowing that the way that Christ has treated us, we treat others. Humility. Others is better than ourselves. Their needs more important than ours. A lot of the descriptions of the early church throughout Acts give the picture of how they handled giving money to each other. If someone had a need, that need was fulfilled. It didn't matter what it had to be. Some people would sell houses, some people would sell businesses, anything they could to meet each other's needs. Because of their love for one another, it explains. Our evangelism is not something that we just go out by ourselves and try to win people over to Christ. It's something that we live our lives before the world. And what does Christ say in the Sermon on the Mount? Let that light so shine before all men because you're sitting on a hill. Let that light so shine before all men that they may see your good works and then glorify your Father who is in heaven. In fact, he goes one step further than that later on. The idea that all men will, you know, will know you are my disciples because of what? Your love for one another. That is where evangelism starts. It starts in unity. But that unity starts in our hearts. When we think of fellowship, we don't usually think of it as the idea of looking out for one another. We think of it as maybe getting along or enjoying things together. Those things are not wrong. They're not bad. But if we leave it and stop there, we leave out a whole section of our church. We leave out people who are going through a hard time. Whatever that hard time may be. The loss of a spouse. The loss of a child. The loss of a job. Anything like that. People get left out when that is where our fellowship stops. People that are going through sin. 
an unfortunate, huge black hole in a lot of our churches. Sin is an issue that we would all prefer was in the past. But in reality, it's with us. It still dwells with us. Our fellowship needs to be one that does not excise that, but it deals with it. This is why Christ says, actually Paul says this, to confess your sins to one another. Why is that? Why confess your sins to one another? It's another one of those aspects we can't deal with on our own. You just can't. Because if you have sin in your life, whether it's unforgiving hearts, whether it's hatred of somebody else, especially of their brethren, any of these things, that sin must be dealt with, and it cannot be dealt with on your own. Accountability is one of the most important aspects of the structure of the church, one of the most important aspects of fellowship. Not just accountability in one area, but in complete openness with another. Why is that so important? It's because sin separates us from God. It's the basic tenet of the reason Christ came. And if sin is still in our lives, which it is in every single one of us, if you are living and breathing here right now, sin is in your life. It's not something we're going to eradicate this side of heaven. That's just the reality of it. Actually, from a show of hands, how many of you sinned this week? Yeah. How many of you didn't? Okay. Now that we've got that out in the open, not that that's okay, but everybody deals with it. And we must be open about it. Because otherwise, we won't deal with it. And it will eat us. And we will not have fellowship. We won't treat each other with humility. And beyond that, we will have no testimony to preach to the world that's dying. Because we haven't, we haven't dealt with the exact same thing we're saying that they can get rid of and that they can have covered over. Sin will destroy us. That's the evil that our front line of defense is guarding against. Not just sin, but things that are against God, of which sin is one of the main ones. We have a front line of defense, and it's, as Paul describes, stationed in unity. We must have that. We must keep it out, because if it gets in, if it breaks in, that was one of the huge weaknesses of the phalanx. If it's a, basically a chain. If one link breaks, the evil gets in, and it can ravage the entire place. And when the phalanx disbanded like that, they didn't stay and fight. They weren't... They weren't equipped to handle hand-to-hand -hand combat. They were equipped to handle working together. And so when they were split, and then when they were scattered around the field, they retreated. Because they had no power by themselves. That's the picture he uses here. The next section is how Christ exemplifies how to walk worthy of the gospel. Ultimate humility. Let's read it. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Did you catch that? He's God, which by nature means he's holy, above everything. Let me ask you this. Did Christ have any responsibility or any necessity to come and save us? Do we deserve it? Did he have to? That's why this is such a good example. That's why Paul uses this, is because Christ doesn't even have that set on him as a necessity, but we do. He didn't have it as a necessity, and he still did it. And didn't just humble himself, or excuse me, didn't just make himself no reputation, he took the form of a slave. He came in the likeness of men. And beyond that, when he found himself, here in verse 8, in the appearance as a man, 
What was his reaction to that? As God finding himself to be man, what was his reaction? He humbled himself. And became obedient. Obedient to the point of what? Where it's uncomfortable? Where it's inconvenient? Obedient to the point of death. The worst of deaths. The death of the cross. That's our example. And that's why I say when somebody says Christ came to live an exemplary life, I said no, he came to die an exemplary death. That's what we're called to. That's what we saw in Sunday school about what Paul says about this. It doesn't matter if I live or die. As long as Christ is magnified, I rejoice. As long as his gospel is preached, I rejoice. That's what's important. Not me, not my suffering, not my chains, as he was in prison when he wrote this. Not even my death. None of this is important, save the gospel is preached. What's God's reaction to that humility? God's reaction to that humility. Verse 9. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is, the glo- is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Christ was obedient. Christ humbled himself. That's our example. When we become Christians, we do the same thing. Salvation starts in humility, just like fellowship does. Salvation starts in humility. God, I cannot do this. I am wholly against you in every way. Fellowship is just an outworking of salvation. In fact, they're spoken of as interchangeable terms in 1 John. When you're saved, you enter into the fellowship. That's just what you do. Because you humble yourself before the Father. And then what happens? What's his reaction? He exalts us. By putting on our account Christ's propitiation of death. That exaltation still works. It's how our salvation even has any power. It's because that exaltation, which is in our experience a new life in Christ, that exaltation is something we can't make. It's something Christ does for us. It not only gives us an ability to live together in a way that nobody else can, it gives for us hope. Hope. How did God exalt Christ? raised him from the dead, brought him to heaven and gave him a name above every name. How does Christ do that for us? He's given us the hope that we will have that same thing. He's spoken of in Colossians as the firstborn over all creation, the idea that he is the first resurrected of those who are promised to have resurrection. That's us. Death is a, a hard thing to deal with sometimes. But in reality, it's the universal equalizer between all of us. We will all die. But God's made a way out of that. We may all die. We may all come to the end of our physical lives. But to have hope beyond that is something that is reserved for those who follow Christ specifically. This is what God has promised to us. So in understanding that, it's not only the key to salvation, it's not only the way in which we interact with each other, it's not only the way we have unity or fellowship, it is the exact way we live out the salvation that we claim to have. This is why he says in verse 27, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. You have to realize this. It is of extreme importance because you will not spread the gospel if you do not get this. People will not see that there is something different in your life by yourself. 
They have to see you interacting with other people. That's what gives our message power. And if we don't have unity, if we do not have fellowship, if we do not have any of these things, and we simply claim that we have sins that are covered over and it's made no change in our life whatsoever, we have no gospel of power, we have no salvation, we have nothing outside of what man can make for himself. This is not a religion. This is life. And that life from Christ. Because he is not only our example in life, but he is our example in death. He humbled himself. We must do the same. That is how we become Christians. We admit, Lord, we do not have what it takes to save ourselves from our sin because it separated us from you. We can't make our lives acceptable before you because we are wholly bent away from anything good. We recognize that there is no one good but God. And we beg of you to save us. That is how humility starts in the life of a Christian. That's when a Christian's born. Paul describes it in Romans, the idea that if we were once saved by faith, which is essentially in that humility, do we then walk in works? Do we then make our lives acceptable to God? Do we then improve ourselves so that we'll be acceptable to God in one way or another? He says, certainly not. What's begun in faith must continue in faith. What began in humility must continue in humility. And that is how we reach the world. That is how we reach each other. He gave Christ a name which is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of those in heaven and on those on earth, and of those under the earth. By the way, you will bow to Christ one way or another. Whether of your own volition or of his. the end of James, he promised us, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and then what happens? He will lift you up. It's a weird economy. I'll be the first to grant that. It's not something that man conjures up. That humility leads to exaltation. But it's the pattern we see in Christ, and it's the pattern we see in our own lives it's the pattern that gives us the hope that we will reach heaven as someday. There are a few things that are certain in life. One of them is death. And we were all facing that, some sooner than others, some later than others, but we were all facing it. There's only one way to be ready for that. And that is through Christ. Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's going to be a great day when we're all there, isn't it? There's a song that remind, I'm, I'm reminded of what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me to the land that he's promised, what a day, a glorious day that will be. There's no hope outside that. There's no other God but the one who is God and there is no other. And there's no way to him outside of Christ. And there's no way to him in our pride. There's no way to continue in our lives with pride. There's no way to continue in fellowship with pride. There's no unity. And the only thing we have to hope for with pride is evil is sin. Look to Christ and be saved. Will you pray with me?
our Father teaches humility. It's not something we do on our own. It's not something we conjure up or manufacture. It's something you do in us. Would you remove any disunity in our body? Any unforgiveness? Any hate? Any exaltation of oneself at the expense of another, which is the exact opposite of what your son has done for us. Your son has done for us what nobody could do, which is to benefit us at his expense, but it could only come from you, from God. That salvation is something we treasure. Teach us to walk worthy of the gospel of Christ. Teach us to fulfill that call. And from that, our testimony will go out to this world, the world that's dying, that we have life. A world without hope. We have hope. Teach us to live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. Teach us to live humbly and walk worthy of that. In your Son's name, who gives us that example and that power, we pray this. Amen.